All right. Now, at this stage uh, in Point Air Life, we're supposed to be able to be tracing the tracks from the spinal cord both to and from the cerebral cortex. Yeah? Uh, you know, you're going to be very up in your ascending and your descending tracks. Now, the only chapter we have probably go through today is the one that we can actually test. When you see a patient in front of you, you can actually test these tracks. So what are some of these tracks we can test? There are some ascending and some descending ones. What are the ascending tracks that we can test for? Ascending tracks that we can test for. So we know we can test for the spinal salamic. If you look at this schema here, this is from your bars. So this is the region of the spinal salamic track here. What else we can test for? Yeah. Sorry? You can't hear me or you can't see? Hello. Hello? Hello? Yeah. So I'm saying there's some... Yeah. So we said there are... A number of ascending and descending tracks that we can test for. Where's your feedback? You get that feedback? Okay. All right. So the ascending tracks that we will talk about is we said for pain and temperature, the spinal thalamic. We talk about the dorsal column, medial lemniscal system, as it relates to proprioception, fine touch. All right, and then the other one that we can test for are actually the spinal cerebellar tracts, for which there are two: the dorsal and the ventral spinal cerebellar tracts. All right. As it relates to the descending tracts, that we can actually have an idea and test for. The one that you did first would have been the corticospinal tract, for which there's uh, two components: the main one, the lateral corticospinal, and the anterior or ventral cortical spinal. So the other track that we can actually test for and it runs in the brainstem as it relates to the spinal thalamic track would be the descending hypothalamic as it relates to if there's a lesion you get a, what we call a harness syndrome. Yes. Hello. 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 That's worse. How's that? That's better. All right. So let's try and trace some of these tracks now. We'll start with the which one you want to start with? The descending. Let's start with the ascending first. All right. Now this is what represents. This is a schema here showing both. This is spinal cord showing both input and output. So we go dorsally. So this will be a dorsal root ventrally as it relates to motor. So when you did your, uh, your physiology, you broke up these nerves into what we call whether the small nerves, which are relatively unmyelinated, some of them, and the larger nerves. So we know as it relates to proprioception, etc., we're going to be using the larger nerves, which are myelinated. As it relates to fine shot, I mean temperature in that region, as it relates to the spinal salami, we're going to be using smaller nerves, especially unmyelinated C fibers. Okay? Now, what is one of the principles that we use as it relates to the sensory pathways? To mediate sensation, as it relates to the, the dorsal column and the spinal thalamic tracts, how many neurons we need for you to get sensation to your cortex? You need at least three neurons, yeah? So we're not talking about any pathway in specific right now, we're just talking generally. So what are these three neurons? So we know coming from the periphery, as it relates to whichever receptor that is, you have 
Yeah, so I'm going towards this final call. Where's the no the cell body for these axons located? Anybody have an idea? That's a root ganglia. Alright? So that's the first order. Now the second order, there are a number of things that we can note about it. Now this second order is always going to what? Cross the midline. Okay? Whether it be in the spinal cord as it relates to the anterior lateral system or in the brainstem as it relates to the dorsal color system. So it's always going to cross the midline and go towards the thalamus. And then you get the third order neuron running from the thalamus up to the cortex. Okay? So as it relates now to the pain part, well, let's do the dorsal color pattern first. This is dorsal column pathway. Try and zoom in on this one here. I don't know if you can get it. Yeah, come out a little bit. Come out a little Come out a little Yeah. All right. So, the large diameter fibers, don't move it. The large diameter fibers, these are they. They're going to come in where which roots? We said the dorsal roots and get into the dorsal columns. Now, there are two dorsal columns. What are these dorsal columns now? Huh? So there are two columns, right? The gracile and the cuneate. Now, which one is related to the lower limb? Gracilis. Alright? So that's important. Because what happens is that if you should go across the region of the lumbar spinal cord, how much, how much dorsal columns do you think you'll see? You'll only see one. Okay? As opposed to if you should color across the cervical region, how many dorsal column tracks you'll see? You'll see two. Which one is going to be on the outer? Which one is going to be on the outer aspect, more lateral aspect? Yes. Alright? So what happens is that from the lower limb, these tracks, as it relates to gracile fasciculus, they're going to run medially. As you go, and you get the fibers coming in from the upper limb, they're going to go where there is space, where there is space, going to be further laterally. So we're talking about the cuneate fasciculus, all right? So that's the first order, the first order neuron. Having come in, it's going to ascend. No synapse is going to ascend in one of these two fasciculi, depending on where we're dealing with upper limb or lower limb. And they're going to run to where? It's going to run towards the medulla, as it relates to these nuclei, whether it be the gracile or the cuneate nucleus in the medulla. Alright? Now, in the medulla, what is going to happen? What is going to happen? This is where we are right now. Medulla. You're going to get the second order neuron, which is going to cross. Okay? So, what is these crossing fibers known as? Internal. These are the internal arcuate fibers, and these are then going to ascend contralaterally from one side, cross. So you're going to be your medial longitudinal fasciculus. Alright? Mm -hmm. Now this medial longitudinal fasciculus is named medial for a particular reason. Yes, it travels medially. Alright? Mm -hmm. Now you guys know why we need to know the position of these tracks in the spinal cord, right? In the brainstem. Essentially we kind of group what's happening in the brainstem into what we say medial and lateral areas. Yes, and these are based on, for the most part, the blood supply of the brainstem. When you go do your blood supply, you would realize the brainstem essentially supply from a medial aspect and a lateral aspect. So when there are problems, we try to identify what's happening medially as opposed to laterally. So this medial lemniscus, which for the most part ascends medially, if there is a lesion in the medial brainstem, this medial lemniscus will be affected. So below, you'll get a problem with proprioception, etc. Alright? Then if you should take it up, it's going to go towards the thalamus. You guys remember which thalamus we're dealing with? Which part of the thalamus we're dealing with? PPL. PPL. Alright, so there you see it ascending. There's this region right here where we the punch right now. That's it. So it stays medially until we reach the region of the brainstem where it starts turning. Then going in a relatively lateral position towards who? Thalamus. This is it right here. Alright? Ventral posterior lateral thalamus. 
Okay? So from here, you'll then get your third order neuron projected into your sensory cortex. So that's the basal column medial lemniscus system. Okay? Now the next one that we deal with now is as it relates to what now? Pain. So we're talking about the anterior lateral or the spinothalamic system. Anterior lateral, anterior lateral. Okay? Spinothalamic. So again, what happens? If you go back to your spinal cord, you see these relatively small fibers here. C fibers, which are unmelanated and small melanated. These are getting via the, the dorsal roots into the spinal cord region. They run up and down for a bit in this dorsolateral trachylisteral, but more importantly, they're going to synapse right away in the dorsal horn region. So you then get your second order neuron at the level of the spinal cord. That's what's happening right here. So the, it's going to then cross, this second order neuron is going to then cross anterior to this central canal as what? Well, as the ventral white commissure and then ascend in the spinal thalamic tract. So that's what you see here. Yes? So having come in, they're going to sign up immediately. The second order neuron is going to cross at the level of the spinal cord and ascend in the entolateral system. And where it's an anterolateral system is that unlike Sorry, just going back, these are going to ascend towards the same nucleus in the thalamus. But what you notice in the brainstem, in traveling up the brainstem, what is the position of this anterior lateral system, the spinal thalamic tract? It's relatively lateral. Do you follow what I'm saying? We spoke about the dorsal column medial lemniscus system. The medial lemniscus travels in the brainstem relatively medially. You follow why? Do you know why I said that? When we, read, when we went back, we said normally, as it relates to the brainstem, you can't remember, okay, the spinal thalamic tract, part of the spinal lemniscus travels at this point in the midbrain or the brainstem or the pons, wherever, at this exact point. You can't remember that. At least me, I can't remember it. So how we tend to group them, we say, hey, these tracks in the brainstem, they're going to travel relatively medially or laterally. Why we do it like that? Based on the blood supply. Why? The blood supply of the brainstem is, you can divide it up as to a medial aspect and a lateral aspect. Because if a medial aspect goes, we know what happens. If a lateral aspect goes, we know what happens. So you go back now. So, as it relates to touch, as it relates to proprioception, the medial lemniscus is going to travel relatively medially. As it relates to the spinal lemniscus, as it relates to temperature, and gross touch, that spinal that spinal lemniscus is gonna run relatively laterally in the in the brain stem. Okay? And when you go proximally it's gonna approach the the same nucleus in the thalamus and then you get the projection to the the cortex. Should I step back or everybody's okay with that? Everybody's okay with that? Mm -hmm. Nobody's okay with that. Okay. Alright, let me show you the schema again. So, you need to get sensation from the periphery to the cortex. Agree? So, we know for the most part, there are two pathways that you're going to get the sensation to the cortex, right? One as it relates to proprioception, etc. We call that the which system? Dorsal column, medial lemniscus system. One as it relates to temperature and pain, we call that what now? The what? Spinothalamic system. Alright? 
So what you are supposed to be able to do is to trace what is happening from the peripheral nerve up to the cortex. So what do we do? We start at the peripheral nerve, we look at what is happening at the level of the spinal cord, then we trace the track up into the brainstem, we want to know what is happening in the brainstem, and then we trace from the brainstem to the cortex. Yes? So what we're saying is that, one, we have to appreciate the types of fibers that mediate these sensations. So the first thing we said, hey, larger myelinated fibers are going to be going to be mediating proper section, etc. Smaller, some of which are unmelanated C fibers are going to be mediating your pain and temperature. Yes? Then we say, where are these going to enter in the spinal cord? Well, not ventrally. Ventrally is motor. So they're going to enter dorsally. So then we say, having entered the dorsal cord, the dorsal part of the spinal cord, where do these fibers then run? And we said they are two possible pathways. We traced one, the first one we traced was the dorsal column, the last one we traced was the spinal salamic one here. So we said, what happens when these fibers, the large diameter, proprioception, come and go into your dorsal column system? So are we okay with the spinal cord level here? Are we okay here? Yes. So what happens from here now? We trace it up the spinal cord. I'll stop and show you where we're at. So we're at the level of the spinal cord still. Do you see the, spine, do you see the dorsal columns here? Yes? Do you understand where there are two at this level and sometimes there is only one? At this level, both gracile and cuneate fasciculi are present because you have your upper limbs and your lower limbs combining together. As opposed to, if you should take a section of the lumbar spinal cord, how many dorsal columns are you going to see? Only one. So we trace it. We're at the level of the, the proximal spinal cord. This is cervical. We go into the brainstem. Now we see them. Where next would they stop? They're going to stop at the right here. This is the medullary region right here. They're going to go to synapse, where we get the second order neuron, both at the gracile and cuneate nucleus. Yes? Remember we said we have how many neurons we have to trace? Three. Once it's sensory, we have to trace three. Okay? So we trace the first one as it relates to the dorsal column for proprioception from periphery up to medulla. So we then say now, what is going to happen to the second order neuron now? So the second order neuron now, what did we say it has to do? It has to cross the midline and go towards where? The salamis. So when it crosses the midline, we say, what does it name? What is it name? It's the internal arcuate fibers. And then it's going to ascend in the midbrain as the what? Medial longitudinal fasciculus. We say we should have an idea that this, sorry, medial lemniscus. So we should have an idea that this guy is traveling relatively medially. Yes? Why? Because as we say, in the brainstem, structures which are medially, we can generally group them, as opposed to structures which are laterally, we can generally group them. Why? This is based on their blood supply. Because if we should take out the blood supply immediately, what is going to happen? We'll definitely interrupt the medial lemniscus. So a brainstem lesion medially, you will get a problem with proprioception below. Okay? And then having ascended, the medial lemniscus is going to go towards which nucleus? It's going to go towards the thalamus. Which nucleus in the thalamus? We say ventral posterior lateral. So there's what you see right here. And then the third order neuron is easy, it's going to go towards the cortex. Everybody's okay with that? Or should I say it? Zero other times. Zero other times. So the next one now that we trace is which one now? The one for pain. Okay? What happens with the one for pain now? We go back here. Sorry. Right here. So 
So we say paint fibers now and temperature fibers, what are they going to do different now? Instead of when they get in, they go up with synapsin. When they get in into the dorsal horn, they're going to synapse immediately. Yes? So at the level of the spinal cord, you get your second order neuron. You see the second order neuron here? So a second order neuron will then cross in the anterior lateral system on this side. That's what you see. It's not on this here. So this guy coming in here is not coming to here. This guy coming in here is going to cross right here and then go into the anterior lateral system on the other side. So the crossing is immediate in the spinal cord. Everybody okay with that? Oh, it shifted. All right, let's keep it on. Let's zoom out. Yeah, man, zoom out. So what we're saying with respect to pain and temperature, these guys, unlike with respect to proprioception, proprioception, we said the fibers are just going to go in and go up. No synapse. These guys, with respect to temperature, and pain, they're going to synapse immediately in the dorsal horn. So you then get this second order neuron at the level of the spinal cord. And then they are going to ascend, they're going to go across in the ventral tract, anterior to the central canal, and then ascend on the other side. Right? So when you see this spinothalamic tract here, where did the fibers come from? This side? No. They came from this side, synapse to the dorsal heart, and then cross to ascend on the other side. Okay? So the second order neuron has set cross at the spinal cord level. So when you trace it up into the brainstem now, what do you see? This is the anterior lateral pathway, same spinal thalamic tract. Relatively what? laterally okay so it's going to travel up relatively laterally here is a component of the spinal lemniscus because there are other tracks associated which you can test for and it's going to go relatively lateral until it reaches the home the same nucleus in the thalamus so from the thalamus you get your third order neuron so this is where when you should get for example as an example if i should cut my spinal cord on this side. Which side is this? This is the right side. Yeah? What is going to happen below with respect on the same side with respect to proprioception? Will I be able to know where my right foot is? No. Because the dorsal column ascended ipsilaterally on that side. How about temperature on this side? Would I be able to find out temperature on this side? Yes, because the temperature tracks from this side, as soon as I got into the spinal cord, they went across and went up. So on this side, I won't be able to appreciate proprioception, but I can still feel with respect to temperature and touch. On the other side now, what is going to happen? The dorsal columns will be able to come up, so I'll be able to appreciate proprioception on this side, but pain on this side, they went across, so they would be cut. So I won't be able to pay, appreciate pain and temperature on this side. Everybody okay with that? Yes. All right. So the other the other trap that we say we can test for is which trap? We can test for the spinal cerebellar traps, which is what you see right here. You want to zoom in on this? Don't zoom in on it just yet. We know the positions of these tracks from the spinal cord schema. How many tracks are there? Essentially, for the most, if you want to get into details, there are about three tracks, right? As it relates to the trunk and the lower limb, we're going to be dealing with the dorsal spinal cerebellum and the ventral spinal cerebellum. Yes? As it relates to the upper limbs, we have the cuneus cerebellum. Okay? Now, the thing about the cerebellum, what you would realize is that the cerebellum on one side deals with which side of the body? The same side. So what you realize is that anything that, if it crosses, 
it has to go back on the other side to get to the same side. So as it relates to the dorsal and the ventral spinal cerebellum, the dorsal tract, which is what is seen here in purple, is going to ascend ipsilaterally in the spinal cord. When it gets into the brainstem, how does it get into the cerebellum? He chooses the first cerebellum the doctor is going to find. Which one is that? So there is what you see. It is traveling in the inferior cerebellum the doctor. All right? Now the ventral one, I like to think about it. He's going about it in an indirect way. Yeah? So the ventral one, which is what you're tracing in green, having crossed at the level of the spinal cord, almost doing what the spinal thalamic tract was doing, yeah? he's going to ascend on the other side of the spinal cord and get up into the brainstem. Now, having gotten into the brainstem on the other side, remember we said each side of the spinal cord deals with the ipsilateral side. So what he has to do, he has to cross the midline. And we know he's not going to use the inferior cerebellum peduncle. Can he use the middle cerebellum peduncle? No, because there's only one thing happening in the middle cerebral peduncle. You guys know that, right? So he's going to use the other peduncle that he has available to him, which is the superior cerebellum peduncle. Okay? So that's the cerebellar tracts, both dorsal and ventral. Any questions with that one there? We're just tracing them. We're not talking about function today. Any questions? Questions? No. All right, so the first descending track that we do, we mentioned, is the descending track as it relates to the sympathetic nervous system. You guys remember the autonomic nervous system? Yes. Everybody got to sleep, so we're going to do that one today. Let's do the cardiac spinal track. All right. What's the principle as it relates to the cortical spinal tract and movement? How many neurons do you need at least? You said for those sensation, both for, for perception and temperature, how many neurons do you need? At least three. For movement motor, we said we need at least two. Okay? So we have one coming from the cortex. Usually crosses at some point in time to go to the other side, which is why the right side, your right hemisphere, usually deals with which side for movement. The other side, the left side, it crosses. Okay, and then he's gonna go down into the spinal cord to the level of the ventral horn, and then from the ventral horn you get to your ventral motor roots. So you get two, two neurons, right? So we usually call the one from the cortex down to the ventral horn, the upper motor neuron, and the one from the ventral horn out to the muscle, the lower motor neuron. You guys understand why we have to distinguish between an upper motor neuron and a lower motor neuron? Is this Spanish to you guys? You guys know this already, right? Do you know why you have to distinguish what is an upper motor neuron and a lower motor neuron? Yes. All right, let me just show you here, just quickly. We're not tracing the cortical spinal tract. We're just talking about the concept of an upper and a lower motor neuron. Now, the lower motor neuron, you know, muscles, the muscles are innervated by sensory. It has their muscles have tendons, etc. They have sensory organs associated with them. That's how you meet their proprioception, etc. And coming from these guys here, the, they set up reflexes at the level of the lower motor neuron in the spinal cord. You see this region right here? Yes? Why am I able, if I prick my finger, I can do this? That's a reflex. There are a number of reflexes at the level of the spinal cord as it relates to this region here. There are a number of reflexes. All right? Some of these reflexes are primitive reflexes. What do we mean by that? You lose them after, soon after birth. Okay? 
Well, some of these reflexes, in addition to being protective, etc., they also have to maintain tone. Okay? Now, why do we need to know that? We said generally, the influence of the upper motor neuron on the lower motor neuron is inhibitory. Okay? That is why, in another thought, a lot of the reflexes it has a, have as a child, they're not there because they are being repressed by the upper motor neuron. Okay? So what should I happen if I lesion the upper motor neuron? If you lesion the upper motor neuron, for a stroke or whatever, these reflexes are going to be what? Are inhibited or exaggerated. So for example, somebody who has a stroke, when you go and you examine them, what is going to happen to their tones? if the reflexes and the tone is increased. They're going to be hypertonic. When you test their reflexes, they're going to be hyperreflexive. And actually, some of the reflexes that they would have had as a child would actually now be present. So you hear us talking about the Babinsky reflex, etc. Why is that? They've lost the upper motor neuron influence, inhibitory influence. As opposed to somebody who has a lesion of the lower motor neuron, whether it be from the ventral horn or the nerve itself, what is going to happen to them? Yes, you've lost one of the loop, one of the limbs of the reflex. So they're going to be, what is happening to tone? They're going to be hypotonic, they're going to be floppy. When you do the reflexes, they're going to be almost absent and there won't be any primitive reflexes. So we have to distinguish between what is an upper and a low motor neuron. Why? Again, clinically, you can tell somebody is weak in their hand, you can, by examining them, you are able to tell, hey, does this person have an upper motor neuron lesion or a low motor neuron lesion? Okay? So having said that now, we have to trace what is happening to this, this upper motor neuron now. Because you guys did what is happening to the low motor neuron when you first entered medical school. Yes? So you just have to do now what is happening to the lower motor neuron. So where do you start? You start at the motor cortex. Yes? Motor cortex. Yes? From the motor cortex, where is the first order neuron going to go to? How is it going to go to the brain stem? Get down to the brain stem. It has to travel through the internal has to travel through the internal capsule. This is the internal capsule here. And we can tell where these fibers are traveling in the internal capsule. This is anterior limb, this is the genuine, this is the posterior limb. Yes? Which cortical, well, we know it already. The cortical bulb is going to be traveling in the genuine. Cortical bulb as it relates to what? Cranial nerves for the most part, right? Mm -hmm. And then the posterior limb is what's going to be dealing with is what's going to be dealing with with respect to the, the limbs and your trunk. And we can arrange it. We know anterior leaves are related to the upper limb, the mid part as it relates to the trunk, and more posterior is that relates to the lower limb. We can arrange these fibers in the, in the internal capsule. So having gone down now, you guys did the brainstem already, so you can trace them down. So there you see where, what level is this? This is, this is midbrain region, so this is cerebrary. So these are the particle spiral right here, in the cross. We go down, we see them here. What is going to happen in the pods? They are going to break up. You guys know where they break up? Yes, the pontus cerebellar fibers cross and they're going to break them up. Yeah? What's happening when we reach the medulla? They're going to reform. And that's why when you see the medulla, we talk about these pyramids. The pyramids are essentially the cortical spinal tracts going down. And then at the level of the spinal medulla junction, you get a decussation, in which most of the fibers are going to cross as the lateral cortical spinal. And then a minority of them are going to descend ipsilaterally as the anterior cortical spinal. So, you got out to the spinal cord again. So, you realize what we did. For sensory, we start at periphery, go up north. For motor, we start at cortex and go down south. So, what happens at the level of the spinal cord now? This is what happens. 
having come down ipsilaterally, the lateral corticospinal tract, they will then synapse on ventral horn neurons, the second order. Movement. Those which came down on the other side, well, yeah, the anterior corticospinal, they would eventually cross at the spinal cord level. So both sides would cross. The lateral corticospinal, they cross at the spinal medullary region. The anterior corticospinal cross segmentally in the spinal cord, which is what you see here. And we know anterior corticospinal for the most part is going to be your more proximal muscles, tone, etc. Lateral corticospinal, which is what you see here, is going to remain it for your lateral muscles. Guys, I finish with you here now. Any questions? Anything else you want to know? All right, let's just put in one more thing and then we call it charge. All right, this is a diagram of what? Just zoom out on it. What's this diagram showing? Well, if you could read the fine print, you see it says, overview of the sympathetic outflow. Agree? Yes? Hello? Yes. Yeah, man. All right, now where did I put this here? Now, you guys know where they... When we did the sympathetic nervous system, we mentioned their pre and post ganglionic neurons. Where do the where the nerve cell bodies are the pre ganglionic neurons located? So IML are the lateral horns, yes? Which part of the spinal cord? So we say it's a thoracolumbar region. So we say from T1 to L1, L2. Yes? So if I should cut the cervical spinal cord, would I say a, a lateral horn? Mm -hmm. No. If I should cut the lower lumbar region, would I say a lateral horn? Mm -hmm. No. Now these preganglionic neurons are influenced by fibers coming from the hypothalamus. Yes? Descended hypothalamic fibers. Yeah? Now the reason what the reason why you have to know about this, right? is that these fibers, do you have any idea where they would travel in the brain stem? Going once, going twice, medially or laterally? They are going to be running relatively laterally. Laterally near to which color? Near to the spinal thalamic tracts. Yes? Why we tell you that? A person who has a lesion with the spinal thalamic tracts especially in the brainstem, will almost always have a lesion of these descending hypothalamic fibers. And this will be reflected in what in the patient? If we're interrupting this descending pathway, there's no output down here. So you will get what is there. That means there's no input up into the cranial cavity. So you get what is called harder syndrome. Okay? And the components of the harm of Horner syndrome is what? So you get ptosis, no sweating on one side, and the pupil is constricted. Yes? All right. So what we mentioned was that we are going through some of the tracks which you can test for. Agree? Spinal thalamic. You feeling pain? I'm not feeling any pain. Do you know where your finger is? North, south, east, west. Yes, you can test for that. Particle spinal, please leave the room. I'm about to leave the room. Yes? Also can move, yeah? We say one of the tracks we can assess also is the, as it relates to the sympathetic nervous system. Yes? Because if there is a lesion of it and it is affecting the sympathetic input into the cranial cavity, you will get a what? An ipsilateral Horner syndrome. How does sympathetic fibers get into the cranial cavity? So they will leave the superior cervical ganglion. Which artery are they going to follow? Internal carotid artery to get into the brain. 
if you should cut that sympathetic outflow, which is what you see right here, how would you know what is happening to the patient? How can you look at the patient and know that that superior cervical gland is cut? You say you get a harness syndrome. What are the components of the harness? Once you look at the person, the eyelid will be treated. Yes? Partial, because the levator palpable is not only has sympathetic input. In. Okay? What else would you see? They'll complain lack of sweating on the same side of the face. What else would you know? When you take your flashlight to do your pupillary reflexes, you'll notice that the pupil is what? Constricted, not dilated. Yes? So what you're saying is that if we trace it back as to where it came from originally, the hypothalamus, we said this hypothalamic influence on the sympathetic nervous system here runs in the spinal cord near to the region of the spinal thalamic tract. Why we say that? Because again, in this map, spinal thalamic tract runs relatively where in the, spine, in the brainstem? Relatively laterally. If you should have a vascular accident and your lesion, the lateral brainstem, lateral medulla, you're going to lesion which? The anterior lateral spinal thalamic tract. So always say, in addition to that, you will also lesion the descending hypothalamus. And you can also test for that. Because if you lesion the descending hypothalamus, that, that region, you get what? A ipsilateral harness, which you can test the patient for. Alright? So that was just what we were just putting on as it relates to how can you see a patient, yeah? putting everything together and say, hey, the lesion is X, Y, and Z. So we're just putting on this as just to say that somebody who has a lesion in the brainstem as it relates to the spinal thalamic tract, they will also have an ipsilateral harness syndrome. Do you understand that statement? Why? Because this spinal thalamic tract, if it's coming down on this side, and if it is lesion, which side of the body is going to be affected? The contralateral side. But which side of the body can have the harness? The ipsilateral side. Yes? Alright. Alright. Uh, one last thing to mention. The other concept as it relates to the motor nerves and then the DPO. Hopefully, that, I think Dr. Thomas should be here by then. Alright. Yes, copy break. All right. Now the next thing we tell you about is what is the difference between the motor innervation of your limbs, your trunk, and your lower limbs, well, your upper limb, trunk, and lower limbs, as opposed to what is happening to it, your cranial nerve innervation of muscles. Anybody know the difference? What's the difference? So if you follow this schema here, this line is what it relates to what is happening in spinal cord as well as the upper limb, your lower limb, etc. But that it relates to cortical bulbar innervation, that is your cranial nerve, motor nuclei. Each nucleus is has bilateral innervation. So for example, your ocular motor nucleus, which is located in your midbrain, will get input from both the right side of cortex and the left side of cortex. And that's a generalization of all of your bulbar nuclei, except one. Except one. So you follow that concept? Generally, as it relates to the spinal cord, this lower motor neuron will get innervation from an upper motor neuron on the other side of the brain, of the brain. But as it relates to your brain stem and your cranial nerves, these motor nuclei will get innervation from both the right side and the left side bilaterally. So generally, if somebody should have a stroke, there usually isn't any problem with their movement. 
Yes? If you get a stroke and be said, you should still be able to do general stuff with your mouth, your eyes, etc. Except as it relates to the facial nerve, there's a little difference right there. Okay? Now what is happening to the facial nerve? The facial nerve, there's a difference in what is happening to the facial nerve, what controls the upper part of your facial movement and what happens to the lower part of your face, the facial movement. As it relates to the upper face, what happens? It gets input from both sides the same way. Yes? But as it relates to the lower face, it does not get bilateral input. It only gets input from the other side. So the lower face behaves typically as to what happens with your lower limbs, the trunk, and your and the upper limbs. Yes? How can we use this clinically? How can we use this clinically? Generally, for example, let's say this person here, this is the left side of the face, and this person has a stroke on the right side, as you see here. What is going to happen? The upper part of the facial nerve nucleus gets input from the left side, so I'll still be able to open eyes and wrinkle my forehead. But the lower part of the other side, which is the left side, having gotten cut off from the other side will not be able to work. Okay? As opposed to if you cut the nerve itself or you have a lower motor neuron lesion which affected the nucleus itself, the whole face will be affected because all of the nerve completely is disrupted. So again, we use the concept again of an upper motor neuron lesion and a lower motor neuron lesion to examine a patient to say, hey, this is the problem. Should I say that again? <coughs> huh? Everybody, everybody okay with that? Or everybody asleep? Everybody asleep? All right. So, again, we said, what was the generalization? Generally, as it relates to the cortical input into cranial nerve motor nuclei, this nucleus on this side, the left side, will get input from the same side, the left side, and the same and the opposite side, the right side. Generally, that's a generalization. But we said except, and we like to use these exceptions because that's how we can distinguish things. So the exception we use, we said, is the facial nerve motor nucleus. You know, the facial nerve has polymotor nuclei associated with it. But we talk about the motor nucleus. So we said the upper part of the nucleus, as it relates to that relating to the eyes and your forehead, behaves like everybody else and gets input from both sides. Yes? But the lower part behaves like the limbs and the trunk, only gets input from the other side. So we are using the example here, if you get a stroke on the right side of your face, yes? Will I have weakness of my tongue? No, because the tongue and lucas on that side is getting input from the other side, yes? But will I, as it relates to the facial nerve here, do you get a stroke here? The upper part, moving the eye, wrinkling your, your forehead, the upper part is getting input from the left side, so I can still do this. But the lower part, his input came from the same side that you got the stroke, so you won't be able to move your, your mouth. Okay? So that's how we can distinguish an upper motor neural lesion. How about a lower motor neural lesion now? If it affects the nucleus or the nerve, we cut everything coming from the nerve. So the entire face can move. Yes? The entire face can move with a lower motor neural lesion. Yes? So we can use that. So you look at somebody and you say, wrinkle your forehead. They can't do it. Smile, they can do it. You can tell straight away, hey, this person probably didn't have a stroke affecting their cortex. 
this person has something affecting the nerve itself, whether it be the nerve itself or the nucleus of the nerve itself. Right? And usually when it as it relates to the nerve itself, there are number of lesions. A lot of the times the lesion is as it relates to the not the seventh nerve, but the eighth nerve, you get by the schwannoma, it compresses the cranial nerve cell. You guys know seven intermediates and eight goes through internal and muscle meters together. Yeah? So you look at somebody now, they can move their eyes up here, but they can't move down here. Then you say, wait, this person probably has a cortical lesion, not necessarily a lesion of the nerve or the nucleus itself. Yeah? Anyway, you don't have me for the afternoon. Alright, so.